Nippon, that was a very tough act to follow, but I will try my best. What if we lived off the grid? The year is 2020. You're living in a house. There's a road coming up to the house, but that's really about it. There's no wires. There's no, you know, there's no electricity flowing. There, there isn't a water pipe. There isn't gas pipes. How exactly would you cater for yourself? For those basic household services that we who live on the grid take for granted. So we're looking seven years ahead. This is a challenge I actually set my team last year. But I made it a little bit more difficult. I said, you need to come up with a vision for 2020 that solves these basic needs, living completely off the grid, but you need to do it with technology that exists today. I don't want any magic bullet solutions. I don't want you to invent something that's going to happen in three, four years. You need to think about the technology that's there today and project it forward. And secondly, you need to do it for under $2 a day. And I don't mean $2 per solution. I mean the whole basic access to services that households need being covered for under $2 a day. Now, of course, th this isn't an academic exercise. You know, um, in the work that I do, that my colleagues do, every day we're trying to work on poverty alleviation issues. And one of the things that always strikes us is that, look, we understand how people get into poverty. A lot of those kind of issues are, are well understood. But the main reason that many of them stay and why it's been so hard to shift the endemic poverty issues is that access to basic services the kind of things that is productive consumption is missing because we, we are forcibly putting a lot of people off the grid. So for me, this was a hypothetical question that I posed to you. How are you going to live off the grid in 2020? But this is a forced reality for over a billion people. It's just a quick statistics on this. You know, more than one and a half billion people or over a quarter of the world's population do not have access to electricity. And 250 million who do have access basically don't actually have any uh, electricity running through it. The BOP spends close to $18 billion annually to get access to light. So these people who are not connected to the grid, they're spending on things like kerosene and candles just to get that first bit of light for an hour every night, racks up to around $18 billion. Similarly, if you look at water, 46% of the world's population doesn't have access to pipe water. And they're spending close to $20 billion on just accessing uh, some clean water, two to eight liters a day. Two and a half billion don't have access to piped gas and LPG. That's 35% of the world. And are spending over $35 billion annually on sticks, on wooden sticks, on forms of biomass, on charcoal and wood for cooking purposes. An incredibly dangerous exercise and an inefficient exercise. Now, here's sort of a good and bad news story. I mean, 68% of total households do not have access to the, the internet. And that may surprise many of you. 37% don't have telephone lines, and 25% don't have televisions. But phones have really taken off. There's actually almost as many phones as there are people. That's partly because many people have two. But they, these phones have now become the primary source of not just communication, but actually entertainment and often access to the net. And a lot of people are predicting that phones will be the primary source by how we access the internet. Because a lot of these grid-based services just don't exist for the majority of households. So one of the things that uh, I asked the team to do is say, if you look at the basic set of services that households need, and this is a little bit of a diagram of the kind of things that you need to think about, you know, like sanitation, lighting, clean water, refrigeration, entertainment, communication, cooking. Now, this is not about dishwashers and lawnmowers. This is about very fundamental services. What's going to happen uh, by 2020? But before we actually do that, let's, let's think a little bit about how these things are accessed today and then start to project forward. I want you to have a look at how the poor access lighting. Now, it would have been quite easy for me to show you a picture of a poor household squinting under kerosene lamps. But in some ways, to me, this is a more vivid picture. In the 21st century, we still have billions of dollars being spent each year on candles. Okay? This is a figure from sub-Saharan Africa where $8 billion is being spent on getting access to lighting. And this is what they're spending it on. 32% on candles, 54% on uh, kerosene, 
4% uh, on biofuels. The picture is very similar for India, although there's more of a spend on kerosene because it's more subsidized. But that's incredible. Billions of dollars in the 21st century, people are lighting candles to have access. Similar picture for, uh, for cooking. There's $108 billion spent annually in the world to, to get fuel for cooking. Of that, at least a third is spent on things such as coal and wood and traditional cooking fuels, which are burnt inside homes as a way of basically being able to cook your daily meal. Again, this is what's happening in the 21st century, and that's real money. So a third of, the, third of the overall expenditure is done by the poor because it's extremely expensive for them to actually cook. On top of this, you have terrible health outcomes. This may surprise many of you. We, we're constantly talking about malaria, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS. The deaths that are linked to solid fuel usage inside the home outweigh all of those diseases. The cr chronic ailments that people get from breathing in these fumes are responsible for, this is a direct link, three to four million deaths each year. This is a very hidden uh, pandemic that is going on. On top of that, the poor are paying an enormous uh, penalty. You know, if you look at the fuel costs for us, for kerosene, for electricity, for a kilocalorie of cooking fuel, for drinking water, this is the additional amount that people in off-grid communities pay to access those services. They're still paying it. It's expensive, but they're actually still paying it. And I think that also uh, represents an actual opportunity. But the good news is that this is going to dramatically change, and that is what my talk is about. That over the next seven years, there are a bunch of really interesting trends that are going to dramatically alter this picture and hopefully get rid of a lot of these statistics. I'm not going to go through all of the trends. I'm going to take you through just a few, but I want to then focus on one which I found particularly interesting. But let's think about some of the things that are going on. Firstly, there's a growing alignment between environmental lobby and the needs of the poor. I started my time in India as an environmentalist, and one of the things that I found very difficult was there was a lot of debate between development and the environment. The lobbies seemed to be at loggerheads with each other, which just did not make any sense. One of the things that's very interesting about providing access to off-grid households, providing basic services to off-grid households, is that it can only be done in an environmentally responsible way. If you want to wait for the grid, you're dreaming. Here is the level of a lack of electrical connections in 2009. These are in millions of, of people around the globe. 20 years from now, here's the projection. There's some change. In Asia, it comes down by 20, 30%. In Africa, it actually grows. The grid is growing slower than the population rate. So if you're going to wait for the grid to come to these, uh, the rescue of these off-grid households, you'll be waiting a very long time. And the only way that we can give uh, these people access is through localized solutions, which means you have to use renewable energy and you have to have appliances that are extremely efficient. So, trend number one, the environmental lobby and the development lobby are aligned on this, which means more money is flowing in, which means there's a greater focus, uh, which is leading to a lot of innovation. The second thing which a lot of people don't talk about is that when you talk about off-grid, you're taking something that used to be a service and you're turning it into a product. Electricity for all of you is a service, and you pay a bill. Electricity in the off-grid uh, world is a product. I can buy it. I, walk up, I go up to a shelf, and I pick up a solar home kit, and that is my electricity. So the pressure that ch Chinese production, and a lot of countries similar to China, have been placing on consumer products on the downward price, we can all debate whether that consumerism is a good thing or not, but at least for the off-grid world, is bringing price points down to a level that the poor can afford. And it's been a dramatic change. Much of the technology that I'll talk about today is not new, but it's become incredibly cheap. But the trend that I really want to talk about is this one. Stuff we want today, poor off-grid households need. There is a direct connection between what is in your pockets and the kind of re technological revolution that is going on in off-grid. Do all of you have phones in your pockets? Why don't you take them out? Let me, let me run you through. Take it. No one in the talk will ever tell you to take out your phones, but I will tell you to take out your phones. Okay. If you look at your phone, its basic componentry is 
a fantastic screen and you want a better screen all the time and, and so forth, a battery life that none of you are happy with, but, uh, but you still want a better screen, and yet your battery life you're not happy with. And these things are actually connected. And so what's happening is there is huge innovation going on around the world to serve your needs because you want to play Angry Birds longer, right? They're building better batteries. They're making more highly efficient LEDs. There is a huge market for solar-based charging for these uh, phones, uh, for the uh, tablets, for these computers. And that is directly leading to benefits off-grid. Now, how is that happening? All of these components can be combined to make this. The off-grid solar lantern market, nobody really cares about, right? If you look at the big manufacturers, if you look at major consumer demand, if you look at any reports on what's, you know, what's a big consumer product, solar off-grid lanterns don't feature. But because of the things that you desire, these things have become a reality. LED technology, uh, along with very efficient batteries and a falling solar panel price, has suddenly, allowed, uh, elec- has suddenly allowed lights to be delivered to off-grid households at a fraction of the cost. We did a projection on this for 2020. And what we found was that if you, uh, for $3 a year, but 150 rupees a year, you can light a room about half the size of this stage with a 60 watt, equi- something equivalent to a 60-watt bulb for five hours a day using this technology. That's incredible. Right now, you use a kerosene lamp that costs $20 a year to run and delivers one-fifth the light. So you're going to get five times the light at one-fifth the cost simply because of some of these technological innovations. And that's actually saving the poor money. It's not just delivering better quality and not to mention the health uh, and safety benefits. So we did that projection. And you can see that the cost of... Uh, on solar, LED, and batteries principally are the things that are driving benefits for the poor. Let me give you a, an offbeat example. I mean, we think about a lot of these technological things, uh, and the same is true for the Akash tablet because of the improvements in battery and, and LEDs and a lot of technology-based things. But here's an interesting offbeat example. This is a very high-end camping cook stove. These guys are selling these things like hotcakes in the U.S. for people who want to be able to enjoy as good a cooking facility as they do at home when they're going for a walk. Okay? It's amazing. It uses a thermoelectric generator that converts some of the heat into energy, and then that uh, actually makes it much more efficient. And as a result, you can even charge your mobile phone with this. The same company is using this technology to make this. And you saw some of the figures I presented on clean cooking and the incredible uh, amount of deaths and cost that is associated with cooking. This cooker, 50% less wood, 95% less smoke. And that's the most important thing. That's the thing that's leading to a, a lot of those deaths. This product will fall in price dramatically as you get to scale over the next seven years. Again, it's bringing some of the highest end technologies down to the BOP level. Here's a basic uh, run-through of the kind of analysis we did. If you look at um, LED, the performance is increasing and the price is falling at the same time. These are amazing, amazing numbers. Advanced batteries, uh, lithium iron, nickel metal hydride, coming down in price dramatically. Solar panels have already fallen. And we have around the corner organic solar. These are all being driven again by your desires, by the things that you want. One of the things that many of us don't realize is we all want to live off-grid. Look at all the advertising that's around you. Wireless, unwired. What is all of that? That is off-grid living. That's because you want to sit next to a beach and have a laptop on your lap and you want to be connected to the world. But you don't want any wires. You want to be wireless. Off-grid households don't have wires. And those two things are coming together where your demands are actually driving, are helping meet some of their needs. So let's quickly look at what uh, 2020 holds. When we conducted all of the analysis, here is what we thought was possible for under $2 a day for a household. Lights. Two lights equal to 60 watts each, five hours a day. 
clean water using nanofilter technology that's becoming cheaper by the minute, eight liters of drinking per person for, cooking, uh, for drinking and cooking. Heating and cooling, an efficient low wattage fan. These are already out there, but it's been very hard to uh, provide enough uh, power to them, but that's solar panels full. This is a reality. There's already a 40 liter fridge in the market that is selling for between 50 to $100. This will fall dramatically as well over the next seven years. And a simple 50 liter fridge running on DC power is extremely affordable in 2020. An all-in-one tablet, about 10 inches, uh, 10, inch, 10 inches wide, that serves as your computer, as a TV, and as, as a tablet. Your mobile phone with internet access. Of course, mobile phones are already there, but the data will be available. And most importantly, regular charging. If you look at Africa, uh, in the next two, three years, there'll be 200 million more subscribers of mobile phones than people with access to electricity to charge it. Cooking, a highly efficient biomass stove, like the one I described, which is largely for high-end consumers, will now be a reality. And finally, sanitation, HDP technology and latrines. These are just some examples of the kind of technologies we've been tracking that are all possible. And all of that for under $600 a year. That's an incredible vision for a household for 2020. They can afford all of the basic things that need for a dignified life. But what's needed to make this work? Because the technology is there. It's there today. The price points will be there tomorrow. Businesses need to wake up and smell the opportunity. That's one of the reasons I showed you those numbers of spend. There is hundreds of billions of dollars being spent in an inefficient way, and there is an opportunity for businesses to take it on. But financing needs to be made available. That $600 I described, what's actually happening is you're buying something for five years. You buy a cook stove that might run for five years. So your upfront cost is quite high, and these are daily wage earners. So even though they can't afford the annual spend, they can't afford the upfront price, and we need to come up with financing solutions. People are already inserting GSM chips into many solar devices to run a pay-as-you-go model, and that's one solution, but we need financial institutions. And finally, you need coordination to solve the chicken and egg problem. You can't sell solar TVs, solar-based or DC TVs, into a market which doesn't have solar panels. You need some of these things to be there for other devices to connect. And that has been a big issue for businesses to actually turn these things into a market. You need a coordinated approach uh, in making these markets work. And that is one of the final parts of the, of the puzzle. I firmly believe that if we can get some of these things right, then the vision for 2020 where every off-grid household can access basic services will be a reality. Thank you.